Hi, everyone. So first of all, thank you from the OIF for participating tonight. And we're very excited for you all to be able to hear tonight's webinar on accessible travel, especially with the national conference coming up this summer. We really hope that you're able to get some good information from this that will help make your travel a smoother experience. I'm just gonna cover a few housekeeping items. So we have a lot of people registered for tonight. So we have all participants mics muted just because we know it's an evening and life is happening around you. So we have them all muted. If you have comments or questions, please use the chat um, and our speakers and the OIF will be monitoring that. Second, this presentation will be recorded, so we'll have that posted sometime early next week. So there's a lot of great information in here, but don't feel like you have to scribble everything down and get it all because you will have access to the recording later on to be able to review certain sections or rewatch the whole thing. And now I'm going to pass this meeting over to Aaron and Josh, who will be presenting tonight. Thank you, Kenna, and thank you to the OIF for uh, allowing this uh, opportunity here. Um, hi, my name is Aaron, and uh, I am an accessible travel specialist based in Vancouver with knowledge not only for about Canada, Canadian travel, but also U.S. travel. Uh, so Josh and I have both uh, crafted together a well-thought-out slideshow that also allows pe people who have some, um, who, who may be hard of hearing, uh, we have crafted this slideshow together to, um, it, we, we've, we've developed it in a way that, that, that'll, that makes things accessible. So without further ado, let's get started with this presentation. <clears throat> uh, who can share? And... All right, can everybody see this? Can... Make it presentation mode, Aaron. All right, here we go. This is the Accessible Travel 101 webinar, where we are going to be looking into researching, planning, and commencing an itinerary for the wheelchair-dependent traveler. So welcome to Accessible Travel 101, which is brought to you by the Osteogenesis Imperfecta Foundation, hosted by myself, Aaron Bush, and Joshua Werner. My name is Aaron, and I am a seasoned accessible travel specialist with over four years of industry experience, uh, coupled with a rich 20-year journey through the lens of firsthand disability perspective. And joining me is... Hi, everyone. I'm Josh Warner. Um, my adventure spirit and uh, with, uh, my living with Ostrogos Imperfecta has taken me across many continents from the castles of Scotland to the landscapes of South Africa. Um, I normally travel with my service dog and I use a wheelchair. Um, my journey through the continents of England, Germany, Ireland, and Canada, as well as many of the uh, states within the United States, um, has equipped me with a wealth of practical insights. Um, I speak from my personal experience with OI, um, but I'm not a uh, professional travel consultant like Aaron is. I'm more so taking on the role of a, uh, someone who has firsthand knowledge. So here's the plan. Delving into accessible travel can be complex. It's time consuming. <laughs> There's a mass of technical endurance and simple missteps can lead to significant repercussions. And airlines aren't in the business of turning our luggage into abstract pieces of art, nor do they list wheelchair mishandling as part of their included offerings. Unfortunately, these instances are known to happen. You may find this idea as off-putting. You may have even developed your own protective strategies. And whatever the case, we're here to help bring clarity to the process in four unique segments. Part one will be the planning stage. 
Part two will be the booking stage. Part three will be the traveling stage. And after that, we will have a Q&A forum. All right, so what's not gonna be covered? Uh, giving, given the vastness of accessible travel as a topic, um, which could span conversations over months or even years, um, our objective <laughs> is to delve into the information into a concise 90 minute webinar. Um, we're gonna shift the focus um, to tackling the most common challenges that, indiv that individuals with OI may encounter. Um, we're not gonna know everything. Um, I'm gonna be transparent that Aaron and I bring a lot of real world ex travel experience um, and we've, but that we've set aside some, and we set aside some time at the end for a Q and A uh, for those questions that you may have. It answers the questions that you may have that we have not answered during this presentation. Um, we'll get specific, but not too specific. Um, we won't be covering in depth um, legalities of uh, specific airlines or the accessibility of individual hotels at, at, at each exotic destinations or visa requirements that you might need to travel internationally. Generally, a travel consultant might manage those questions on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and we will provide, uh, we'll provide Aaron's contact information at the end of the Q&A if you have more questions. Um, and we can't eliminate all the problems. Uh, we we all have a story to share, and we all might have legit legitimate grievances. We're not going to we're not downplaying these conflicts. The information in this webinar isn't intended to eliminate the problem, but rather to arm you with information that will help you mitigate the issues that may occur. So let's start with part one, which is the planning stage. How do we turn an idea into a reality? Step one, determine your travel goals. What do you want? Are you looking for relaxation, adventure, some cultural experiences? What primary interests are you seeking from your trip? Where are you thinking of traveling to? Hawaii, part of Vallarta, Paris, Disney? Step two, research the optimal travel dates. Your trip may intersect with local or international festivities, which may draw in larger crowds and or increase your price. You may benefit from more heavily discounted rates in the off-peak season, the trade-off being unpredictable weather patterns or the absence of certain inclusions. Number three, consider your activities. Websites like Viator and TripAdvisor will help you explore various attractions that are offered within your travel dates. It's important to identify their location in relationship to your accommodations and whether they can be easily accessed by local transportation. And number four, assess the neighborhood's accessibility. Utilize online resources to gain an understanding of the area's accessibility. This includes accommodations, public transportation, venues of interest, even sidewalks. Something as simple as Street View on Google Maps will work wonders. Josh. Accessibility deep dive part one. How to verify if a place is accessible. Nobody will understand your needs as well as you do. When you need an accurate assessment of the property's accessibility, start by speaking to somebody who can visually recognize what your inherent what you intend to book. If you're booking a resort in Mexico and the call center is based in the Philippines, the agent may not have specialized perspective on the property's overall accessibility. Skip the call center route by instead opting to reach out to the venue directly. Uh, you need to be very specific in recognizing that uh, certain details may be inevitably overlooked. And here's a bonus tip. Try a Google search for disability organizations in the city you'll be traveling to. Then try reaching out to see if there is anyone on staff who can share insights or resources for local accessibility. For example, in Vancouver, we have a large number of different organizations such as the Disability Alliance, Inclusion BC, Neil Squire, Connectra, and the Rickanson Foundation. While they may not specialize 
and services specifically for tourism, they may be able to share insights on Vancouver's accessibility, such, uh, such as suggesting specific resources or recommend a third party to guide you further. So and that brings, go ahead. You're good. So this is the local transportation accessibility, Josh. Yes. Oh, yeah. So Americans and Canadians benefit from laws safeguarding uh, the rights of those with disabilities. Through these uh, protections do not apply outside the United States of Canada. If you rely on public transport, such as trains, buses, ferries, taxis, Ubers, or lifts, ask if they could provide a ramp or a special lift to ensure that stations and vehicles are step free and accessible when you need them. It is usually necessary to let a private motor coach in advance to accommodate uh, mobility devices such as power wheelchairs. That brings us to part 1B, researching your flights. Now, step one was all about your goals. Where are you interested in traveling? When are you thinking of traveling? What steps are you taking to avoid accessibility challenges with local attractions, transportation, and accommodations? And next, I'm going to cover flights. And starting with an itinerary from Seattle, Washington to Phoenix, Arizona. This is something I pulled up on Google Flights. It's not necessarily a bad itinerary for the average traveler, but it does have some significant conflicts when traveling with a mobility device. So. I'm going to open up chat here for a moment and just ask everybody to take a look at this itinerary and see if you can call out any potential problems. If you can take a look at this itinerary here and if you can spot any problems, type your messages in chat here. And let's see what people come up with. Just give them a moment here. And am I... Not enough time to transfer from one flight to another. All right, we've got one response. I'll give you I'll give you guys a few more a few more seconds here. Uh, Another 30 seconds here. It's a tight timeline. Also thinking about melting hot sidewalks and wheelchair tires. Any last any last minute comments? Different airports? Don't be shy. There's no wrong answers here. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Minimize. Oh. One last minute. Is there a math? Okay. We'll get to the questions in the, at, at the end here. Here are the challenges. One, we have an early departure. It leaves at 7.35 in the morning. Number two, we got one of our, we got one person that got this one. The layover is only one hour and four minutes. Number three, the aircraft from Seattle is an Embraer. That's a tough one. And what I didn't show you was that there are nonstop flights from Seattle to Phoenix. Or, yes. So here are the challenges explained. For a domestic departure, your arrival time needs to be two hours before your departure, before the time your flight leaves. In this example, you need to be at the SeaTac airport by no later than 5.35 in the morning because it leaves at 7.35. You cannot depend on Uber, Lyft, taxis, etc. This choice would be better if you live in or near Seattle. If you have reliable transportation to Seattle, 
or you can book a hotel within walking distance of the SeaTac airport. There's quite a number of them. Number two, the layover is only one hour and four minutes. When traveling with a mobility device, you're going to be the first person to board in Seattle, but the last to be played in Idaho. You would be making a mad dash in Idaho, and that is assuming there are no delays upon taking off or landing at the Idaho airport. Number three, Seattle to, I <clears throat> excuse me, Seattle to Idaho is an Embraer 175. This was a tough one. An Embraer 175 allows a maximum of 35 inches in height for cargo clearance, which is ridiculously small for your average electric wheelchair. This significantly increases the probability of being deplaned or receiving your mobility device back broken. And number four, Seattle does offer nonstop flights to Phoenix. Each layover significantly increases the risk of potential damage to your mobility device. You might be paying $100 more for nonstop, but more importantly, you are paying for peace of mind. Josh. All right, so the aircraft cargo door size. Um, will the airplane, will the wheelchair fit on the plane? Um, when, you're plane when you're planning a trip with a mobility device, you must always be mindful that the height and width of your device does not exceed the dimensions of the aircraft cargo door. If you ignore this warning, you may have you may be deplaned and rescheduled. Passengers may miss their connections, and your mobility device could end up broken upon your arrival. We provide information on the A to Z website um, the, of the most used aircraft dimensions and the units in my life. And this is a snippet from the website of the most common airplanes with their sites. So just give you a second to if you want to like take a picture of it with your phone or write it down or whatever. Just uh, yeah. Now for now for those that can't see this or because I know it's quite small, uh you don't want to you don't necessarily need to be too mindful of the width because most of these numbers are going to accommodate a power wheelchair. What you do need to be mindful of is the height. So for the Boeing 717, it's 28 inches. The 737 is 35 inches. 757 is 44 inches. The 767 is 69 inches. The 777 is 67 inches. The 787 is also 67 inches. The CRJ regional jet is among the lowest at 33 inches. The Embraer jets are 35 inches. The Airbus A220s are 32 inches. The Airbus 319s, 320s, and 321s are 47 inches. The uh, Airbus 330s are 66 inches, and the Airbus 350s are 69 inches. This is going to be your go-to every time you travel. So how do you identify the best itinerary? Which airlines can you trust? <clears throat> In the United States, each airline has a long list of mandates set by the Air Carrier Access Act, the ACAA. You don't need to commit any of these to memory. They are in place to accommodate passengers with disabilities, with policies varying by each airline. You can search up blog posts and YouTube videos from wheelchair-dependent travelers who have shared their thoughts and utilize resources like Facebook, Reddit, and LinkedIn to identify the most trustworthy travel partners. And number two, nonstop flights and unnecessary connections. You might be thinking, hold on, why should I pay more for a nonstop flight when I could save money by transferring in Boise? It's simple. You're on the clock the moment you arrive at your departing airport. If your transfer time in Boise is 64 minutes, they aren't going to wait for any unforeseen delays you might be having in Seattle or potential in-flight delays or additional delays from deplating in Boise. You're also handing off your mobility device to four ramp agents instead of two, and this significantly increases the risk of receiving it back damaged or broken. So always opt for non-stop, or if you must transfer, provide yourself ample time to connect on the layover. Number three, how big is the aircraft? This is, goes back to the chart that I was showing you uh, previously. So foldable wheelchairs may be able to get stored in the passenger cabin, but powered mobility devices are reliant on the respective height of the cargo door. Your problematic aircrafts will be the Boeing 717, 
the 737 or the 737 Max, the Airbus 220, Embraer's, and the regional jets, CRJ 700, 900, also called Canadair or Canadair. As these planes are measure in at less than 35 inches or 88 centimeters, the aircraft will typically be listed on the itinerary. You don't need to always look at that chart that we were showing you. It'll be on your itinerary most of the time, like on Expedia or on Google Flights or the official airline website. Number four is if it's often marked as delayed. <clears throat> you might not find this information on platforms like Expedia, Flight Hub, et cetera, but by cross-referencing the flight number, for example, AC120, which will be an Air Canada, Air Canada flight on Google Flights, you can identify if there are any known trends in delays with the route you plan on booking. This is how it would look on Google Flights. Josh. You right, there. I'm gonna meet myself. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, all right, so never leave home without travel insurance, especially in the white community, a rough transfer, a bad sneeze, an overlooked pothole, or an unfortunate misstep might, might necessitate an immediate medical attention. Check with your insurance policy to see if you're covered for pre-existing conditions when traveling out, out of state or outside of Canada and the United States. And don't leave without it. Service type policies. Service animals will typically require a clean bill of health from a registered veterinarian when traveling outside of the United States. This is in place to prevent the transmission of communicable diseases such as rabies or Lyme disease. Domestically, you're only tied to the policy set in place by each individual airline. Confirm this information with the airline before you book to ensure that the policies aren't overly complex. This is this would be falling into the disability desk of each airline. Um, and then a note about low-cost carriers. Carriers like Spirit Airlines, JetBlue, Allegiant must still abide by the Air Carrier Access Act but their policies and onboard services may be more limited. So you may be more, you may be required to pay more for your seating assignments or baggage, or, and you may encounter greater challenges when receiving potential issues that you may have with your wheelchair if it gets broken um, during the flight. It may be harder to file a claim. So let's look at Omaha because a lot of people in here may, be, may have joined because they want to know, well, I booked my flight for Omaha, or I'm planning to book my flight for Omaha. If you have already started planning or booking your flight to the National Conference in Omaha, you may have noticed the staggering number of Boeing 737s and Embraers in play between your departing airport and Epley Airfield, which is the airport in Omaha. After all, the Boeing 737 is one of the most common aircrafts used in the industry. So let's look at what to plan for when you don't have any alternatives beyond that of a Boeing 737 or an Embraer. Most importantly, we've identified that the maximum height for the Boeing 737 is 35 inches. So you want to adjust the maximum height of your wheelchair to 35 inches. You don't need to settle for a manual wheelchair if it means a significant dependency on able-bodied people. You don't need to settle for an old backup you aren't going to be comfortable with. You do also don't need to wait until your travel date to find out if your mobility device will fit within the Boeing 737 or the Embraer's 35-inch maximum allowance. We know how tall it is already. You don't need to settle for less. Using a tape measure will help you determine the height of your mobility device, but do not include any removable parts, such as the headrests or the armrests. Check to see if your mobility device, such as the Permobile, has a small latch allowing you to easily unhook or, and remount the backrest. You don't want ramp agents doing this uh, on your behalf. Determine if the back handles can be lowered or safely removed with an Allen wrench. If your backrest has power or manual recline. 
shift the position until it meets, meets the 35 inch allowance. Power tilt may lower the backrest assembly below the 35 inch allowance, but raise the armrests and joystick assembly in return. Confirm that the device is not elevated before taking these measurements. Contact a professional if any adjustments require an Allen wrench, or if you must do it yourself, take a photo of any angles and positions before making the modifications to the unit. And that brings us to part 1C. This is the last step of the planning stage. Transportation and accommodations. So let's imagine for step three, we're going to open up chat here for a moment, so get your keyboards ready, that you want to book a trip to Walt Disney World in Orlando. This is easy. We're going to assume that for this trip, you would like to stay at the Beach Club Resort, as it's close to several different restaurants in the Epcot area. However, before we delve deeper into accommodations, we still need to plan our transfers from Orlando International Airport to Walt Disney World Resort, since there is a 45-minute commute, commute between the two. Does anybody in the chat session know which transportation provider in Orlando we, we would most likely use to make this commute? And I'm not talking about Uber or Lyft. If you can think of the name, type it in chat. Disney's Magical Express. That's what they were used to. That's what they used to be called. There is a new provider now, though. We'll give it people here another 30 seconds. Everybody is like, Google search, Google search, Google search. What's the, what's the name? What's the name? Google's your friend, by the way. Yep. All right. Monterey, no. The answer to that is Mears Connect. Now, requesting a wheelchair accessible shuttle from the airport is largely the same in most major cities, especially in Canada and the United States. If you're traveling internationally, you will want to conduct diligent research to identify the most reputable transportation providers in the area. Call them in advance to verify if your mobility device can be loaded on board the vehicle. You need to be very precise about this, as some providers may think the wheelchair is to be loaded with the luggage and that the traveler can climb up a couple of steps. Do not assume that every city will have accessible transportation readily available. In our Orlando example, you can request the shuttle either on the day of travel, travel or the day before. However, not all policies are the same and some providers may require at least 24 to 48 hours advance notice. Some cities may not have accessible transportation at all. Reservations vary from each transportation provider, but can typically be made days, weeks, if not months in advance. So in our example, before settling on the beach club, the first step should be to assess the room accessibility. How do you do that when, you, <laughs> when we're not at the hotel? Online references can be misleading as photos may appear more or less spacious than the actual room itself. When you reserve a room at the Walt Disney World Resort or on Expedia, Travelocity, etc., you aren't actually booking a specific room, but rather the category of that room. You can always request these specifics with the hotel, albeit that's not guaranteed. This is what you can do. One, check the official website. Many suppliers position their accessible rooms in locations that are, paradoxically, quite inaccessible. You may need to do some digging. Some suppliers offer photos of these rooms. Others merely mention their availability through brief text descriptions. Number two, check TripAdvisor, YouTube, or the Google business page. If you're staying at a popular resort, such as our Walt Disney World reference, 
you will likely find YouTube videos or recent reviews on TripAdvisor that are abundant in photos. Checking out TripAdvisor, YouTube, Street View on Google Maps, and the Google business page is always a good starting point for information. Number three, the internet is full of answers. From Facebook groups and Reddit communities to forums and websites dedicated to accessible travel. If you're still searching for answers, try asking in a Facebook group or Reddit community. There, you might connect with other travelers who have insights and personalized recommendations. Number four, contact an accessible travel agent. When it comes to travel agents that specialize in accessible travel, we bring an added layer of understanding and expertise that can significantly benefit travelers with disabilities. This specialization often translates into more effective advocacy and tailored travel solutions. While many travel agents are committed to meeting diverse needs, those with a focus on accessible travel or personal experience in the field may provide insights and accommodations that your average professional might not fully anticipate. Contact a disability organization. We covered this previously in step two, but depending on where you are traveling to, try reaching out to one of the area's local disability organizations. They may have insights for trusted sources they can recommend. You can reach out to the supplier directly. If you've exhausted all other alternatives, try reaching out to the supplier directly, by which I mean the front desk or the front desk supervisor. You may be able to receive additional guidance or clarity that will bring that will bring you peace of mind. And lastly, you can research the building's art architect. This would be a real moonshot, but if the building was just recently completed, you might try researching the architect that built it to see if they have anything shown in their own public portfolio. For cruise considerations, research the port accessibility. Certain ports of call may not be wheelchair friendly, especially when the vessel needs to be tendered. You'll also want to look up the offerings for your ports of call to determine if there are sufficient wheelchair accessible excursions available before you book the itinerary. These will typically be labeled as either A, allowing you to remain in your wheelchair, B, that you have to transfer, C, that you have to climb steps, or D, it's just not accessible. Next is you can consider equipment rentals. Whether you require portable lifts, recliners, respiratory support, manual or power wheelchairs, or a hospital bed, there are services like Special Needs at Sea, for example, who can make these deliveries possible. And lastly, is the cruise accessible? Researching everything on the itinerary, including the supplier, the stateroom, the ports of call, public amenities and inclusions, Onloading and offloading procedures, emergency procedures, as well as any international mandates that may affect your experience. Older vessels also tend to suffer from more narrow corridors. This could be problematic when trying to access your stateroom while housekeeping is actively cleaning. For van rental considerations, if you need a wheelchair accessible vehicle at your destination, Rental companies charge by 24 hour increments. You need to be meticulous about this. If your pickup time for the vehicle is 11 a.m. on May 23rd and you're expected to return it at 11, uh, you are, um, and you're expected to return it on, uh, one more time. If you if your pick up the vehicle at 11 a.m. on May 23rd and are expected to return it at 11 a.m. on May 25th, it must be returned at that time. Returning it at 1 p.m. will incur you an extra day's fee. Your driver's license may only work in North America. If you have a standard driver's license issued in the state of Vermont, it's not going to work if you're traveling to Italy. It likely won't. Now, you may be a world-class driver, but that card in your wallet is typically only valid in Canada, United States, Mexico. You need to apply for an international license when traveling abroad. Number three, review the policies before making the booking. 
Companies will expect you to pay for mileage, provide proof of insurance, pay for incurred damages, even gas up before returning the vehicle. They'll charge you double of what you would pay at the pump and may even ding you for damage incurred that wasn't your doing. You can get around this by inspecting the vehicle with the person uh, at, the, at the office and taking lots of pictures. You will find plenty of companies on Google that offer adaptive vehicles for rent. Just be mindful to do your research before proceeding with the booking. We've made it to the booking stage, which is professional counsel versus the self-made booking. I'm going to give myself a brief break here. Josh, you can, you can pick this one. Great. So um, you've undoubtedly realized that managing your own bookings can be challenging, but it's not impossible. What about a travel agent group? Well, uh, there seems to be, sorry. Well, there's, there, sorry. There seems to be uh, this perception that travel agents may not be the best resources to assist clients with mobility challenges. This perception may be based on things like your budget, prior negative experience, or simply the lack of disability perspective. Instead, the traveler may opt to take uh, the booking onto themselves by going through another online uh, search engine uh, or contacting the airlines directly. Um, number one, your travel agent still knows what they're doing. Even if your travel agent isn't um, accessibility trained, they still, um, your travel agent isn't um, an AI. Um, at least I hope that they're not. Um, it's not, um, they're, it's a human to human relationship. Um, there are tons of travel agents um, out there who are absolutely understand the ins and outs of the business. They'll work with you as uh, well as the airline and, and the suppliers to ensure that you're well taken care of. They may just lack the perspective of traveling with a mobility device. You just need to be very uh, precise in telling them what you need. Um, what's more, there are travel agents like Aaron, who specializes in accessible travel, who can be an advocate for your interests for the disability perspective. Number two, um, it can save you a lot of time and money and a few headaches. Your travel agent isn't about um, planning, playing deceptive, uh, deceptive bait and switch tactics. They're generally aimed to snag you the best rates through unique contacts with suppliers and uh, affiliations like Ritual. So, uh, Remember, their business doesn't evolve on, on, on unhappy clients. Uh, these beliefs of which you won't be, I'm sorry. These benefits. <laughs> sorry these, about that. These benefits. Yeah, sorry. These benefits, which you won't be able to assess on your own, are tailored to uh, to elevate your air experiences. Dressing about flight modifications, your travel agent may be able to bypass those nightmarish three hour wait times with airlines, allowing you to relax and daydream on your next adventures. Travel agents have uh, insider access de and dedicated support and can provide the cost-effective and personalized and hassle-free services, all designed to maximize your satisfaction. Um, so you're into the DIY travel ride. That's totally cool. Um, there's a unique charm in plotting your own course. The buzz of tailoring your adventure, um, the eternal rush from those last minute wallet sitting changes, um, and the more serene moments where you realize it's all coming together. Number one, confirm, 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 confirm. Confirm that all the information that is correct on your itinerary, including the names exactly as they appear on your on your uh, passport or primary identification documents, 
ensure the passports are expired within six months window of your return date. Um, confirm everyone before confirm with everyone before you complete your booking. Conf confirm that the ticketing rules. Um, uh, rooting. Yeah, sorry, rooting. Um, the transportation accommodations, dietary restrictions, and activities are all in place and everything is correct. Once you have made your payment, you may not be able to easily undo it. And number two, contact the airline. I touched on this before, but contact the airline disability desk. Most airlines have uh, what is called a disability desk and it is not part of the uh, central reservations. Uh, when you're ready to make your booking, you are going to bypass all the travel platforms like Expedia you're planning to use and and but and advise the airline of your needs directly. This might uh, be a portable oxygen service dog, the width and height of your wheelchair, the battery type, um, or challenges with positioning for those who are unable to sit up straight for prolonged periods. If you don't require any preclearance, then you are clear to make the booking. Once the booking has been made, you must provide this information to the disability desk, or you will likely run into the problem at the airport. If you're working with a travel agent, ask the travel agent if you can perform this task yourself, since they won't know you as well as, well as you know yourself. You can, you can then ask um, your travel agent to contact the disability desk to confirm the information. Lastly, the disability desk should be able to assist, assign you bulkhead seats, um, which are areas in the plane um, the airline reserves to travelers using disabilities or having service dogs with them. And then you want to confirm the policies with the airline and the supplier. Um, hotels or the airlines um, may have policies in place, which um, uh, when under eight, when an underage child is traveling with, without both parents on board, this is especially true when traveling internationally. We get it. You want your child to have a good time, but perhaps mom can't schedule time off work. Um, accommodations can be made, uh, but you need to confirm these with the airline and the hotel before you finalize your booking. And then secondly, give your child a letter of consent. Um, your child must keep this information in a safe place. Um, this will include their name exactly as it appears on their passport, their birth date, their place of birth, and passport information. It will also include the, their flight information for uh, when, for, who they will be traveling with and where they will be staying when they arrive. If there, if there is a person who intends to meet the child at their destination, as well as a signed statement of consent from both parents, you may need to have this information notarized depending on your country you're visiting. All right, thank you, Josh. We have made it to part three, which is now the traveling stage. What to do when you are commencing your trip. All right, it's come to the day. You're finally ready to go to the airport. You're, you're, it, it, you've got all this planning and booking stuff out of the way. It's, we're, we're getting towards the day here. Now, before you go to the airport, there's something we want to consider. Maybe the day before, or within the 70, comfortable 72-hour period. First, arrange a service call. This is a big question in the wheelchair community is how do I insure my wheelchair? In Canada and the United States, airlines are legally accountable to repair, replace, and or provide a loaner for your mobility device if it is deemed inoperable. However, the airline can also state the problem was pre-existing before they took possession of it. You can easily counter this argument by calling your vendor and arranging a service call 24 to 72 hours before your flight. Ask for an inspection 
and request a copy of that inspection in writing. Congratulations, you now have documented insurance in case the airline counters your claim. Two, pack your essentials. Consider the climate at your destination, be it rain, snow, or extreme heat. Packing a t-shirt might be natural if you live in Florida, but it won't help you for that November trip to the Rocky Mountains. Remember to include your wheelchair, charger, medications, and important documents, etc. There was also an announcement by the Department of Transportation. I don't believe it's official yet, but there, if you do a, a Google search for the Department of Transportation with a, adding on a, a keyword for wheelchair, you'll find something within the last week that uh, there are new measures coming into place for uh, to assist to to reinforce the policies that are currently in place and a lot of advocates are very supportive of this let's pull the room so we're going to open up the chat room here again to keep things interactive here this is where you will find out if you or your travel agent planned everything properly, starting with your transportation to the airport. So it's 12 a.m. You just arrived at your hotel in Seattle, Washington. You booked through your travel agent. Unfortunately, the travel agent isn't, agency isn't open until 9 a.m. And you have a flight scheduled to leave at 7 a.m. Uh-oh. When you arrive, the staff advised that there are no wheelchair accessible taxis available until 9 a.m. You're going to miss your flight if this doesn't get resolved. All right, chat, what do you do? I'm gonna give everybody a minute here to just throw in some suggestions. There, remember, there's no right or wrong wrong answers that everything is it's all what would you do in this situation look for alternatives all right let's get a little more specific Email your travel agent at sea anyways. They could be up. Give them a phone call. 6 a.m. Help! This should have been booked before you left. Exactly. Yes. Let's assume it was booked before you left, but somebody didn't, uh, somebody didn't look into the accessibility as well as they should have. We'll assume the transportation was booked, but the accessibility questions weren't asked properly. If you're really struggling, you could give a local primary care clinic a call and ask to speak to a social worker or occupational therapist to see if they have suggestions. Interesting. Take a deep breath and remain calm. I think that's the first, I think that's the first one here, Tony. All right. Recognize the problem. We're looking at an issue of private transportation and ride hailing. Yes, I fed you a story of getting to the airport, but the truth is your destination isn't the immediate problem. Instead, we're focused on the mode of transportation issues getting there. Number two is ride hailing. It could be a long shot, but on occasion, you could try local rideshare platforms like Uber or Lyft for any wheelchair accessible vehicles, WAVs. Number three, check with hotel management. Some hotels may offer private wheelchair accessible shuttles. Generally, this should be assessed during the planning stage, but last minute arrangements can be made in certain emergency situations. Check with the concierge or hotel management. You could also try late night transit. SeaTac Airport is a massive international travel hub and Google Maps may have insights on whether there is public transportation that will help you reach your destination. Depending on the conditions, 
of your hotel booking, you may be able to arrange a refund either through the hotel directly or via the travel agency that booked it, then make a trek or pulling an all-nighter at the airport. All right, you've arrived at the airport. What do we do? First off, before we get into any of the airport stuff, let's assume, let's rewind a little bit here. You wanna prepay for your luggage online before your travel date. Checked baggage will almost always cost you more if you pay for it at the airport. If you are ever asked to pay for your mobility device, ask to speak to a supervisor. That's not okay. Number two, go to the checking counter upon your arrival. You're going to receive an email that says, uh, time to check in 24 hours before your flight. You can save a little bit of time doing this, uh, but you still need to go to the checking counter at the airport if you're traveling with a mobility device. Once there, request a tag for your mobility device and request any assistance you may need tra traversing the airport. Confirm the information they have is correct, such as seating assignments or the specifications of your mobility device. You need to be at the airport two hours early for domestic flights and three hours if you're traveling internationally. Your next step is to go through security and customs. You might be able to save time in the lineup with TSA PreCheck or Nexus, but you will still need to hand off your bags, portable electronics, and receive a swab or pat down. You cannot take your mobility device through the metal detector, but you can request a private screening. If you're going through customs, have your passport, tourist visa, and any vaccination records on hand if traveling with a service dog. Most importantly, don't cause a scene. In the face of unexpected events such as overbooked, overbooked flights, encounters with difficult airline agents, or security concerns caused by foreign residue on your mobility device, the key to navigating these situations is a calm, composed, and professional demeanor. This approach is not just a recommendation, but it's a proven strategy. In difficult situations where you might be dealing with an accusation or a misunderstanding, adopting a calm stance to defend yourself and clearly uh, explain your situation is the most effective way to ensure a positive outcome. Don't blow up at the person you're talking to. All right, Josh. So you arrive at your airport. So once you get there, go to your departure gate. Uh, you're going to want to head to your gate before you do anything, any of your shopping um, around the airport. Uh, you never know if your flight's going to begin boarding early or late. And you make sure you want to advise the gate agent if you require an aisle chair and request to speak to the ramp supervisor when handling off your mobility device. Um, me specifically, I need to look, make sure I know where the service dog uh, release areas are. Um, if you're traveling with a service dog, you need to make sure you take him to the bathroom before you get on your flight uh, so there are no onboard incidences. Also, you want to limit their water intake before your flight to lessen any chance of onboard accidents. And for you personally, you want to use the uh, bathroom at the airport. It may be, it's hard to predict whether the flight will be turbulent or if flight attendants will be too busy with other passengers uh, to assist you uh, with your needs. Um, or if the passenger is taking a long time in, in the bathroom themselves. Um, your bladder may uh, be more cooperative on an empty stomach rather than if you guys are down a, a venti Starbucks drink before your flight. So make sure you use the air, you, the bathroom in the airport um, so that you don't have any problems on board. The onboard bathrooms are also usually very small and flight attendants um, may accompany you to escort you into the bathroom and to help you into the outer, but they will not help you with using it. So, and then you wanna um, return to your gate 30 minutes prior to uh, boarding. Um, so you want to allow at least 30 minutes before your flight uh, to make sure to return to your gate and speak to the gate agent if you require an aisle chair and uh, remind them of your need um, of speaking to the ramp supervisor for your mobility device prior to boarding. And then uh, also you want to demonstrate the proper handling 
of your mobility device. Um, so you are the expert expert on your device. Um, no one else knows it better than you. Imagine you're trying to teach a toddler on how to operate your chair. Um, they're going to be impatient and they're going to be distracted. And they'll likely break it if they play around with it. And they probably won't know how to handle it uh, right off the bat. So, and then you want to mark your mobility device with safe lifting zones. Um, at the base of a power wheelchair is low bearing. Uh, this is directly underneath the part that you sit on. And Aaron marks his chair with reflective tape that informs the ramp agents um, that this is where you need to lift the wheelchair if you need to lift it at all. Otherwise, things will break. Um, and then also you want to let them know how you prefer to be transferred. Um, what is the best way to pick you up? Underneath arms, under your legs, and around your back? Um, which areas are you sensitive to? Uh, you also need to be very specific to airport personnel if you're um, loading with an owl chair to ensure the armrests are positioned carefully and that you are strapped in before they move you. Confirm um, there is an owl chair on board your plane. I know we've said this multiple times, but it's very, very important to make sure that there is an owl chair. And then for if I consideration to tell them what's their dog. Um, make sure to bring puppy pads with you on mother flights. Uh, service dogs have to use the bathroom the same way that we do. Try to limit limit their intake of food and water right before the flight um, and bring some puppy pads just in case they need to leave themselves on board. Um, and bring something for them to chew on because at 40,000 feet, our furry friend's ears pop just like ours do. And so pack a chew toy or the boat or something for them to, to chew on so they can ease their ear pressure. Um, and it's a ticket for a comfy tail wagon flight for your free companion. Um, and then also the in-flight considerations for your service dogs. Um, the airlines will prefer a service dog to be resting underneath the seat in front of you, uh, but that's not always possible due to the larger nature of most service dog breeds and their gear that they may be wearing. And airlines, um, set aside the low-cut seats for travelers with disabilities. Um, and this is one of the main benefits for, for requesting uh, low-cut seats during the planning phase. And push back if they say, oh, we're gonna put you in the back seats. So, but just be be firm with them and say, no, I need the bulkhead seats. So, yeah. Now, what to do if you would receive your wheelchair back and something just isn't right? So there's a, seating component that's broken, there is a, it's not turning on, uh, it's, or it's visibly been damaged. This is one of the biggest questions that people ask in the, uh, in the wheelchair community. And it is, uh, it is, I mean, it, it yeah, it's, I'll get started with this slide. What to do when you are reporting, need to report damage to your mobility device. So scenario, we'll go back to Disney. You just arrived in Orlando, you're all ready for Disney, but to your dismay, the airline has delivered your mobility device back in three pieces. What do you do? Well, let's have some chat responses here. I'll give everybody a minute here to uh, to come up with a response for this scenario. Remain calm, absolutely. Again, you've just arrived at your arrival airport. You're loving this vacation that you're looking forward to. There's a lot of anxiety about this question in the community. What happens if I get to my arrival airport? and my wheelchair is broken. There's no right or wrong answers here. They need to help you get a rental. Yeah, if it doesn't work, if something's not functioning properly, they need to fix it, but they also need to get your rental if you can't use it. Push the up button and speak to whoever is in charge. Talk to a supervisor. 
Yes. Number one, don't panic, remain calm. That was our first response. Contact a supervisor and ensure there is always a staff person with you until the problem is resolved. Seating issues may be adjustable with the right tools on board and certainly a bustling airport. Must have an engineer or an Allen wrench around somewhere, right? <laughs> it's an airport. Number two, familiarize yourself with accessing the connections. Before you travel, know how to access things. Generally, ramp agents shouldn't be dissembling a power wheelchair to unplug a cable. But if they do, it will often be via the joystick, the controller, the wire that comes down from the joystick may have a disconnection point. The battery box, you may need to uh, take the lid off to find this one. Or the primary fuse switch. This can be on the back of the wheelchair behind the battery box. On a permobile, for example, it's at the base of the wheelchair on the back, uh, right behind the battery box. You can instruct personnel to take a photo uh, on your or their phone to help you guide them if you cannot see these things yourself. Step three, file a report at the baggage claim office. Once you are back up and running, proceed to the baggage claim office and report the damage to the airline. Only do this during a layover if you have at least two hours before your next flight. If not, have a supervisor provide a written statement of the damage, then report it at your final destination, and do not leave until that report is complete. If you cannot reach baggage claim by yourself, request an escort. You'll then receive a phone call from the airline's mediator, such as Scoot Around, where you can request your need of immediate repairs or a rental unit. What to do if you need to report your device as lost? On rare occasions, the ramp agents won't return your mobility device to the jet bridge. When this happens, just breathe. It's not lost forever. It's just been temporarily misplaced. Contact a supervisor and ensure there is always a staff person with you until the problem is resolved. You don't want to be left alone in the airport. They'll be able to radio the party or parties responsible and track down your mobility device. During a layover, your mo uh, immediate problem should be the connecting flight, not your mobility device. Inform the ramp supervisor and the flight attendants that your mobility device hasn't been returned. Advise them if you have an upcoming flight and request an escort to the next gate. Keep a record of any documents you are given, such as your baggage tags or ticket stubs. And once there, inform the airline and request for a super supervisor. Odds are your device may have ended up at the airport's baggage claim office, or in worst case scenario, been left at your departing airport. Your device is tagged and the airline is legally responsible to locate it, return it to your possession, and provide you with a rental unit if it is deemed necessary. You may also be entitled to a transportation or meal voucher if the delay is significant. All right, Josh, accommodations. So uh, once you're checking into your accommodations, so you made it to your hotel. Now, before you go wandering to the Disney's magical realm of wonders, take a moment to ensure that your room is correct. Um, Request an, request an escort to assist you with your needs. Uh, if you require the, the hotel, will have a bellhop service. Or if they don't, ask for a staff person who can help you bring up your luggage to your room. Adjust and make sure to adjust the position of the phone or any other furniture that may impede you, the mobility in the room. Uh, report inaccessible, excessive inaccessibility challenges immediately. You might be able to resolve in inaccessibility by moving things around, um, but confirm that you have enough space to maneuver between the beds. Uh, check the bathroom is usable, including the toilet, sink, bathtub, or rolling shower. If the positioning of the bench is going to be a prob problem problematic, ask if there is a portable bench available. If there are any issues with accessibility in public spaces, Ask what can be done to be provided so that you aren't being excluded from any experiences. And reputable hotels will make things right. Uh, if there's a problem, be upfront about it. What can the hotel do to make it right? Um, 
is the restaurant accessible? Can room service deliver it to your room? Um, is your room accessible? Can the hotel provide you with an upgrade? Don't sit up for less. You're paying to be there. And don't pay for the upgrade. So, um, during, during your stay, um, diving into the delightful world of travel and dining, uh, we can offer a, a, we can often encounter unexpected challenges that test our ex, ex, adaptability and resourcefulness. Let's explore some common situations where there, uh, where little assistance can go a long way. Number one, uh, requesting assistance in restaurants. Uh, who doesn't love a good buffet? The problem um, is that not everybody can carry a five to 10 pound plate of food back to their table themselves. Uh, you may lack the strength or dexterity, but don't fear. If you're traveling with a support person, uh, just if you're traveling without a support person, just ask a staff member in the restaurant to see if they can provide you with assistance. Um, and also speak to the front desk if you're requiring assistance. Adopting, adapting is the best, adapting the best planning strategies uh, may look great on paper, but things are can often get overlooked when putting them into practice. When you're at land or at sea, the front desk may be may arrange necessary accommodations. It's either through equipment that they might have on hand or by research, reaching out to third party vendors at a nearby uh, port. All right, lastly, we're gonna cover something called the A to Z device profile. You probably haven't heard of this. Now, before I delve into the A to Z device profile, I'd just like to clarify that this is not a plat not a platform endorsed or affiliated with the Osteogenesis Imperfecta Foundation, but rather a digital tool that we created to help travelers navigate these hurdles with their mobility device. We've given you a lot of information. We don't expect you to memorize this all. <laughs> You can always refer back to this at a later time if you need a refresher or hopefully you've made some notes. But what is the A to Z device profile? So remember, ramp agents are busy. So the information you pass along at the gate may get lost during the loading process. And what's more, nobody talks to the ramp agents that are unloading your mobility device. One airport doesn't talk to the other and you can't talk to them either. This is where the device profile comes in. We created a free digital profile that allows you to specify the proper handling instructions of your mobility device, including the width, the height, the weight, the battery type, and any short recordable reference videos that they might find helpful. You can then share that information with the ramp agents via a QR code and update that in real time. While this platform won't eliminate the risks entirely, it has been designed to help you reduce them. You can access this tool by creating a free account on a to z.com, spelled A T Y Z I, or A like Alpha, T like Tango, Y like Yankees, Z like Zebra, I like India. I almost got my fanatics there. <laughs> then selecting the device profile page from the navigation menu. Try using this the next time you travel and see if it provides any benefits. Now that's all the information that we've been providing for the webinar. If you require something more specific that I can help with on a more personalized perspective, this is my contact information at the uh, bottom of the slide here. Spelt my name, Aaron Bush, Aaron.Bush at marlintravel.ca. That's the company I'm working with it. Uh, interning with at Vancouver in Vancouver, their phone number, the extension that I can be reached at, and my availability at that office. I can assist with anything from flights, hotels, cruises, van rentals, vacation packages, or if anybody needs assistance booking their assist trips to Omaha, I am already helping another traveler with that as well. 